Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight uh, on this beautiful summer afternoon. And um, we um, are really pleased to be collaborating with the Science Museum and the Schuhoff Foundation for this particular display. Um, and um, in a way, this exhibition has been a really a natural extension of our exhibition program. And if any of you were here to see last winter the Utopia Limited exhibition, we collaborated um, also with Henry Milner um, on um, reconstructing iconic constructivist um, works. Thank you, John. And if I could invite our next speaker, who is Professor Celia Lutilova, who comes to us from the Graduate School of Architecture at the University uh, of Columbia University. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Milner, for this exceedingly illuminating talk very provocative, and I would like to thank certainly Yelena Sudakova and Professor Miller and uh, Henry Milner and uh, grand, great grandson um, for organizing this amazing initiative, and it's a great honor to be in such a company. I'm particularly happy to be invited to this discussion uh, entitled The Tower, Past, Present, and the Future. Uh, I'm originally from Moscow, so for me it's almost impossible to see the landscape of uh, Shabalovskaya lacking this amazing silhouette and this amazing tower. This is the Rodchenko's iconic work. Um, <clears throat> and re reflecting the core message, uh, looking at the past, present and future, I'm going to talk not only about the timeline, but also I will try to create kind of a geographical grid, yeah? geographical coordinates. How did it, how did, how can we trace the ideas, the provocative ideas of uh, Soviet avant-garde and how these signals of attention towards Soviet avant-garde were very discreet and still are discreet on the landscape of the globe. Um, in 1963, more. In 1963, a prominent German architect, the author of Notorious Olympic Stadium and Public Spaces, director of worldwide famous Stuttgart Design Laboratory and the contributor to NASA space research, um, Frei Otto, a German architect, writes, Schuchow's inventions managed to change the very DNA of architecture and introduce the new grammar of building design. And here lays a particular um, paradox that happened while rediscovering and rethinking the legacy of Soviet avant-garde. While um, ideologically and politically charged uh, monuments such as Tatlin's Tower were rediscovered first in UK, it was Germany to look at the practical message, yeah? at the practical level of, of, and practical amazing potentiality. And um, all this rediscovery happened right before and right after the World War II. In a way, World War II became kind of an extraordinary uh, watershed of thought to rediscover uh, the legacy of the avant-garde. And we know that uh, in 1929, it was a crucial injection of the Soviet government, of Stalin in particular, uh, ideological injection, um, also physical injection uh, into the body of the avant-garde. Basically what happened by eliminating the um, educational, uh, educational campus of, of Hutema school and by um, increasing the efficiency of uh, Vopra pro Stalin's group, uh, basically by, de uh, by um, screwing, yeah, he, he basically, eliminated the idea of free thinking. Uh, Stalin um, decided to get rid of the very dangerous source that was avant-garde at that time, because avant-garde um, considered architecture being a critical discipline, to think in complex about political issues, social issues, and also about uh, everyday life and needs. So coming back to the rediscovery of Shukhov's legacy, uh, it was Vladimir Shukhov who convinced Frei Otto to become an architect. 
because before that, uh, Otto was just a military pilot. And basically, the very idea to redirect his entire life and career happened when he was flying over Dresden. And uh, he was observing this enormous, terrifying um, ruins yeah, of Dresden. Uh, and at that time, he started to look at the alternative ways of dealing with the space and time. Alternative, quasi-transparent, almost invisible architecture that wouldn't imply this enormous masses and thickness of the wall that would be um, very delicate to the environment. Uh, and here what, um, what uh, Ota addresses as the thank you note for, um, uh, for Shukhov, yeah? because Shukhov was one of the first who patented the hyperboloid structures, the famous hyperboloid constructions or systems as Professor Melman mentioned. And um, co in collaboration with various scientific institutes, Ota decided to develop this. Uh, synthetic thought uh, and developed it towards uh, the idea of biomorphic architecture. Here we see one of his most famous uh, works. It's the München uh, Stadium, Olympic Stadium. And here is inside. And we can see a very similar hyperboloid grid over here. Um, so not by chance, uh, in the very core of Otto's laboratory in Stuttgart, we can see the dialogue of Schuchow's first sketches of the, uh, of the tower, uh, and re uh, addressing towards the latest NASA discovery. Here is one image. I particularly like this image because it's kind of blurred. Yeah? It gives us this grid of times, and we'll return back to this. How, how do we preserve this intangible impulse of uh, progressive thought of, so of Soviet avant-garde architecture? Um, and uh, Frey Otto's uh, message was that Shukhov was the uh, kind of universal engineer that could be compared also to the scale of the universe itself and to the NASA overview uh, of uh, the mystery and the wisdom of the world. And he was absolutely right. Not by chance, one of the t official titles of Vladimir Shukhov was an engineer of a universal type or universal scale. And this was an official, I would underline this, pre-revolutionary term. Uh, that started to be uh, active again during the world uh, uh, war time, uh, during the First World War, um, both in Eastern and Western worlds. And the term itself migrated from a different discipline, highlighting also that um, Shukov himself was combining and switching to different disciplines. His thoughts were kind of became umbrella thoughts, yeah, or umbrella uh, approach. Um, uh, way beyond uh, disciplinary grid. So it came from the discipline of medicine originally, and uh, it was rooted in medicine practice. And uh, so we are still in the middle of the war, that's why. Uh, as doctor, and it was called as doctor diagnosed, diagnosed yeah? highlighting the universal approach towards, first of all, the human body. And Shukhov, however, was a diagnosed engineer. Uh, highlighting the approach towards the, uh, the body of architecture. Saying this, I would underline that uh, Shukhov's first uh, education was medicine, and he was trained simultaneously as a doctor and an engineer. And here, uh, therefore, we have this uh, particular signature of his uh, most of his sketches. We can find uh, it as a you know, prescription because uh, these sketches, uh, the signature of the sketches is that we can trace various mediums on just one piece of paper. It would be a section, a plan, a three-dimensional drawing, an axonometric, uh, and sometimes he would even imply a photograph. So he was looking at the program, yeah, at the, at the future project. He was able to project or cast forward. Yeah? We, we know that a project, the term that we are articulating now, the architectural practice, is uh, about the future. Yeah? It's projecting in the future.
future of their ideas. So he was able to project the diagnosis of, of a future architectural body on just one piece of paper. Uh, he was a significant person, never used, maybe Vladimir can tell us more about this, some personal features uh, of his ancestor, uh, traveling only by bicycle. Um, <clears throat> and one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite caricatures of Vladimir Shukov, who uh, wasn't, according to my humble research, wasn't an ex extremely extraordinary tall man, is this uh, amazing uh, caricature of uh, Shukov being a giant Gulliver, straightening up the notorious uh, uh, minaret tower of uh, Ulumbek Midrisa in Samarkand. Uh, he was appointed to straighten up the tower in 1931. And even being uh, highly persecuted by Soviet government, but by highly, I mean the highest possible level. We know that um, during the erection of the uh, Shukhov's Tower, he was accused as an enemy of, uh, of Soviet Union, and he, he was basically almost uh, killed yeah, by the Soviet government. Uh, even though he, he, he was highly persecuted and neglected in a way, uh, it was Stalin's government that uh, has chosen him to, you know, to create, make this significant um, engineering um, work. Here is this notorious uh, Minariat. So again, we can see that he is looking at the architectural body as a synthesis of art, synthesis of thought. Um, and not by chance, as Professor Milner, we are articulating his heritage with a very particular um, terminology. While speaking about Shukov, we are speaking in terms of systems, knots, and joints. Uh, uh, therefore, highlighting that it's a universal approach with some little details where we can zoom in or zoom out. So. <clears throat> In other words, uh, what's striking, the contemporary architects in the legacy or in the heritage of Vladimir Shukhov is this enormous diapason of ideas. Yeah, basically, what, uh, what happened, Shukhov uh, crafted a territory for the new architectural discourse, yeah, uh, widening up or expanding enormously the boundaries of architecture as a critical discipline. Here we can see some of the details. Um, just a few notes about the erection of the tower. One of the most um, significant moments was a new level, a new way of construction that was called telescopic method of construction um, that underlines the erection of a tower without using the scaffolding or self-scaffolding, so-called. Uh, and it was also an ideological move uh, since scaffolding would definitely stop the traffic that in the Soviet uh, you know, environment, early Soviet environment, was considered to be sacral. So traffic for the Soviets, uh, for, for Russia, um, post-revolutionary Russia was equal, had this sac sacral nimbus. Um, the turning point in the career, yeah. here we can see the legacy yeah, of uh, Shukov's Tower in the Soviet past, me being a Soviet girl, a pioneer. Now, I remember this, it's called Global Agan of the Blue Sparkle on the television. Uh, it's the most desirable night during the um, New Year party when there would be this kind of a screen on the TV. And all the you know radio broadcasts, um, television broadcasts would be at that particular background. So in a way, it became an iconic symbol. Um, but the turning, I would I would like to return very briefly to um, uh, to the early career of um, Vladimir Shukhov that could give us some hints how his universal approach was crafted. Um, the turning point of his career happened way before the revolution. 
1896, uh, when together with the scientist um, Dmitry Mendeleev, the uh, author of the notorious periodic table, they traveled uh, the Philadelphia exhibition. Uh, it was the Tsar's family that commissioned these two major brains of the Russian Empire to cross the Atlantic and to, um, you know, to invade, but also to absorb the Western ideas. And things that particular, uh, particular influenced and impressed um, Shukhov, according to his talent, were this kind of communicative, yeah, technological moments. And we can trace several, uh, you know, several paragraphs in his, di uh, in his diaries talking about the weight, yeah, uh, and the wisdom of the new technology that is a transparent, translucent. So the very DNA of the new, of the new world would be entirely different. And I think that, and that's my personal idea, that um, being struck by this very first you know, uh, technological achievements, he already had in mind how he would perceive his career. Uh, so for example, here we see the first telephone or the typing machine. Um, so right after the revolution, his very first client was not by chance Lenin, who uh, Vladimir Lenin, who uh, even though Shukhov had this incredibly successful uh, pre-revolutionary career, as Professor Nivev mentioned, he was from a different generation than Tatlin. He was the, uh, much he was much older, and like he was considered to be the senior avant-garde. Um, uh, mastermind, uh, he was appointed for a very strategic and particular moment in the, uh, in the history of uh, Soviet, early Soviet empire. And it, it, were, it were two uh, towers that were commissioned at more or less at the same time, the Tatlin Tower and um, Shukov's Tower. As Professor Milner mentioned, Tatlin's Tower was an ideological icon tilted on one side with an open end, so it was considered more uh, being um, being a, a ruin, but also in construction. So it has this double dwelling, let's say, uh, with a very particular uh, purpose to also to broadcast um, the ideas of communism. However, in a in a very very specific way. It was an impossible project. Yeah. It was from the very beginning it underlined uh, this impossibility, and that's the beauty, but that's, that's also the downside of the project. So we have only the models or the photographs of the models of Tatlin's Tower. Well, Shukov's Tower was a military object, and I would underline this because it was the first moment, it was the first moment in the history of architecture. Uh, known to me, for example, uh, when metal was withdrawn from military purposes. And it was the special uh, order of Vladimir Lenin, Vladimir himself, under Vladimir Lenin, um, allow, uh, that allowed to withdraw this amount of metal in the erection of the tower. <clears throat> but we, we can create several uh, you know, dialogues. Yeah? It, it is, they are certainly, these colors are certainly uh, they were and they are. Uh, and one of another particular moments is that um, Tatlin's tower was meant to be, according to Professor Linton, uh, connected with the polar star, yeah, and to rotate against the uh, Earth's axis against, um, yeah, but being spreading the voice of communism to the universe, while uh, Shukov's tower. Shukov's Tower was a very, very um, a practical uh, and military, a strategic, uh, a strategic object. Um, to the point that those workers, of the, it was called the Red Brigade that was working on the erection of the tower, they had specific supplies, like food supplies, consumer supplies, and they, they had several special passports or special documents. So they were really um, in a privileged position. Yeah? 
just briefly what happened after the um, <coughs> Columbian infestation uh, of exhibition, Shukov was appointed immediately after his return uh, to be the head engineer of the Bari company. And here he is, uh, we can see one of his major um, projects for Nizhny Novgorod exhibition. Uh, it was a, the, one of the first expos in the Russian and the Tsarist Russia back then in 1896. And we can already see this transparent and uh, translucent grid. And um, uh, he was one of the very first. And some people think that Jean Bricklin thinks that uh, he was actually the only one who, uh, the only architect and engineer who exported his ideas to officially export it. So uh, here we can see that the U.S. Army in South Carolina bought his patent on the hyperboloid structures. Um, coming back to the universal scale, um, across disciplines, he was working for the oil company, uh, tankers, uh, uh, light towers, and certainly for the electrification. To conclude, Radiate Tower is a strategic and revolutionary object and a, a military domain. The voice as a means of for organizing masses demanded a new technology. Radiate Towers working from totally different physical principles that the megaphone or loudspeaker Incidentally, echoing them, uh, their form, radio produced the universal ear, the newspaper without paper, as Lenin said, without borders. This is a significant quote from Shklovsky, a prominent, um, a prominent art historian and ideologist of the Soviet, early Soviet avant-garde uh, art, and I would like to compare it to another quote from uh, American scholar Maria Gaff. When the voice was transformed into ele electrical surges transmitted through wire grids rather than the open air, the extension of the aureal sense became limitless. And I would like to think about this amazing intuition of Vladimir Shukhov back then um, about the synthesis of worlds, yeah, about this kind of new, new ways of communication that today, coming from our perspective of a digital era, uh, gives us an absolutely different you know, landscape of communication. Um, my favorite uh, you know, description of that time of a collaboration of the radio and uh, electricity is that the kilowatt hour was proposed as an index of culture and progress, Shklovsky again. Um, so I would encourage all of us to sign the petition uh, in order to preserve the tower because um, as early as two hours ago, I was speaking on the phone with my colleagues from Dokolomo, Russia, and the latest news uh, about the preservation of the Shukov Tower are very uncertain because, um, because there is still struggle and we have a little chance to keep it on its own place. I would underline that any other alternative to move and reconstruct a grid, a replica, you know, to move it to another location are absolutely unacceptable, especially today, when the UNESCO preservation program signed a, a new law that uh, missed around the building and intangible uh, heritage is equally important to stones and uh, you know, bricks and stones. Um, so the proposition of the government to dismantle the tower and recreate a new one on a, on a different platform is absolutely unacceptable. So thank you very much for your attention.